Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathering together on the 14th Yom, or day, of the third month. It is the 49th day of counting the Omer, and tomorrow is Shavuot on the calendar that we are following from Dead Sea Scrolls. So, exciting times. If you're familiar with anything on the, the writings that are not common to everyone, a lot of people have ideas about when our Mashiach was born, and they believe Tabernacles was when he was dwelling with men, and for whatever reasons, which you can look at the teachings online about that. But if you only go by what's in the text itself, throughout the book of Yobelim in particular, you have every single covenant that was brought into the world was on the 15th of the third month including the word being given to the people and the renewed covenant when believers who are his body were born again. But um, if you look at the account of his birth in the book of Luke and you look at the account of Yitzhak's birth in the book of Yobelim, they line up very similar. And then he was born on the 15th of the third month who was the promised seed type and foreshadow and then the uh, third witness of that is the uh, son Yahuda, the son of Yaakov who was given the rain or the Malkuth he was born the same day as Yitzhak on the 15th of the third month and the promised seed of our Mashiach who was going to be the the reigning king over his people forever is or was born on the on the same day <clears throat> So for what you want to take that for, it is what I found to be rather interesting, but that's not what we're covering today. However, if you happen to be looking at what's in the Apostolic Constitutions on what's profitable to think on on Shabbat, it specifically mentions the, the countings of seven, uh, seven days for a week for the Shabbat and then the counting of the 49 for Shavuot and then the seventh month, and then the seventh year, the Shemitah, and then the Yobel. So it's cycles of seven that are continually repeated as a picture so that men are without excuse is what it says. And we keep the pattern that he's established for us. But we will be continuing here in book eight, if I remember correctly, of the Recognitions of Clement, where they are still having a discussion with his father before they know who he is. So just to back up a little bit, he had talked to his father about the divisions of why things happen, where there is both order and disorder in creation. And because men have liberty of will, they are given, there, there's a contrary thing to everything that proves our creator. Another example for that, which I believe we already covered, was with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, where he had the truth given by Moshe, who was a messenger or a sent one from Elohim himself. And then he had magicians who were able to do the same effects, but they were not from the Almighty. So he was at liberty to choose which ones he, he would, as he was so inclined to do. But right now, it's, this one is chapter what is it, 54, titled An Illustration. It says, to this, the old man answered, show me a way, my son, by which I may establish in my mind one or the other of these two orders, the one of which asserts and the other denies providence. Aquila answered, to one having a right judgment, the decision is easy. For this very thing that you say, order and disorder, may be produced by a contriver, but not by insensible nature. For let us suppose by way of illustration that a great mass were torn from a high rock and cast down headlong. And when clashed upon the ground were broken into many pieces, could it in any way be that amongst the multitude of fragments, 
there should be found even one that should have any perfect shape and or figure and shape. The old man answered, it is impossible. But said Aquila, if there be present a statuary, he can by his skillful hand and reasonable mind form a stone cut from the mountain into whatever figure he pleases. The old man said, this is true. Therefore, says Aquila, when there is not a rational mind, no figure can be formed out of the mass. But when there is a designing mind, there may be both form and deformity. For example, if a workman cuts from the mountain a block to which he desires or wishes to give a form, he must first cut it out unformed and rough. Then by degrees hammering and hewing it by the rule of his art, he expresses the form that he has conceived in his mind. Thus, therefore, from infirmity to deformity, <clears throat> by the hand of the workman form is attained, and both proceed from the workman. In like manner, therefore, the things that are done in the world are accomplished by the providence of a contriver, although they may seem not quite orderly. And therefore, because these two ways have been made known to you, and you have heard the divisions of them, flee from the way of unbelief, lest it lead you to that prince who delights in evils. But follow the way of belief that you may come to that sovereign or king who delights in good men. The two kingdoms. To this the old man answered, but why was that prince made who delights in evil? And from what was he made? Or was he not made? Aquila said, the treatment of that subject belongs to another time, but that you may not go away altogether without an answer to this, I will give a few hints on this subject also. Elohim foreseeing all things before the creation of the world, knowing that the men who were to be would some of them indeed incline to good, but others to the opposite, assigned those who should choose the good to his own government and his own care, and called them his peculiar inheritance. <clears throat> or the word for peculiar treasure in Hebrew is segula, which is a very interesting word worth looking into. I had a friend online that did a study on it once and made a video. I'll share that with you later. But he, or who should choose the good to his own government and his own care and called them his peculiar inheritance. But he gave over the government of those who should turn to evil, to those messengers who, not by their substance, but by opposition, were unwilling to remain with Elohim, being corrupted by the vice of envy and pride. Those, therefore, he made worthy princes of worthy subjects, yet he so delivered them over to those messengers that they have not the power of doing what they will against them unless they transgress the bonds assigned to them from the beginning. And this is the bond assigned, that unless one first do the will of the demons, the demons have no power over him. Then the old man said, you have stated it excellently, my son. It now remains only that you will tell me whence is the substance of evil. For if it was made by Elohim, the evil fruit shows that the root is at fault. For it appears that it also is of an evil nature. But if this substance was co-ageless with Elohim, how can that which was equally unproduced and co-ageless be subject to the other? It was not always, said Aquila, but neither does it necessarily follow that it was made by Elohim, that its creator should be thought to be such as 
is that which was, has been made by him. For indeed, Elohim made the substance of all things. But if a reasonable mind, which has been made by Elohim, does not acquiesce in the instruction or Torah of its creator, and go beyond the bonds of the temperance prescribed to it, how does this reflect on the creator? Or if there is any reason higher than this, we do not know it, for we cannot know anything perfectly, and especially concerning those things for which our ignorance, or sorry, concerning those things for our ignorance of which we are not to be judged. And he means that no one's going to be judged for not knowing right here, for not knowing why evil came about the way it did. No one's going to be judged for not having a solid foundation of the origin of evil outside of what's plainly written in scripture. Anyone who can recall what is plainly written and keep that in their heart as the truth, you won't have any issue with comprehending the things that he talks about. It's, it's that simple. But it also helps you not to be led astray. Right? And this is another thing where it talks about in the renewed covenant, not to be led astray by worthless questions or foolish genealogies and things that aren't profitable. That takes away from the simplicity of the belief which is in Mashiach, right? Which, which is a reformed character and loving the truth. But those things for which we are to be judged are most easy to be comprehended and are dispatched almost in a word. For almost the whole rule of our actions is summed up in this, that what we are unwilling to suffer, we should not do to others. For as you would not be killed, you must beware of killing another. And as you would not have your own marriage violated, you must not defile another's bed. You would not be stolen from, neither must you steal. And every matter of men's actions is comprehended within this rule. Then the old man, do not take it amiss, my son, what I am going to say. Though your words are powerful, yet they cannot lead me to believe that anything can be done apart from Genesis or fate, what we call astrology. For I know that all things have been done to me by the necessity of Genesis, and therefore I cannot be persuaded that either to do well or to do ill is in our power. And if we have not our actions in our power, I cannot believe that there is a judgment to come by which either punishments may be inflicted on the evil or rewards bestowed on the good. In short, since I see that you are initiated in this sort of learning, I will lay before you a few things from the art itself. <clears throat> if, says Aquila, you wish to add anything from that science, my brother Clement will answer you with all care, since he has attended more fully to the science of mathematics. And what they mean by mathematics is the angles and positions of the stars. For I can maintain in other ways that our actions are in our own power, but I ought not to presume upon those things that I have not learned. And this is just like in Sirach ben Yahushua, or what they call Ecclesiasticus. He says that if you know, then give answer. But if you don't know, put a hand over your mouth, right? It's okay to not know something, but you shouldn't presume anything. An assumption is a work of the, the wrong ruach. That's directly mentioned in Clement's first letter on virginity. And it's also plainly said in another way in scripture where he says the um, prove all things, hold fast to that which is tov or good, right? It says plainly in Sirach, ben, again, be ignorant of nothing. But to continue here. Sitting in judgment upon Yahuwah, 
When Aquila had thus spoken, then I, Clement, said, Tomorrow, my father, you will speak as you please, and we will gladly hear you. For I suppose that it will also be gratifying to you that you have to do with those who are not ignorant of the science that you profess. When, therefore, it had been settled between the old man and me that the following day we should hold a discussion on the topic or subject of Genesis, whether all things are done under its influence or there be anything that is not done by Genesis, but by the judgment of the mind, Kepha rose up and began to speak to the following effect. To me, it is exceedingly wonderful that things that can easily be found out, men make difficult by hidden thoughts and words, and those especially who think themselves wise, and who, desiring to comprehend the will of Yahuwah, treat Elohim as if he were a man, indeed, as if he were something less than a man. For no one can know the purpose or mind of a man unless he himself reveals his thoughts. And neither can anyone learn a profession unless he be for a long time instructed by a master. How much more must it be that no one can know the mind or work of the invisible and incomprehensible Elohim unless he himself sends a foreteller to declare his purpose and expound the way of his creation. So far as it is lawful for men to learn it. Hence, I think it ridiculous when men judge of the power of Elohim in natural ways and think that this is possible and that impossible to him, or this greater and that less, while they are ignorant of everything, who being unrighteous judge the righteous Yahuwah, unskilled judge the contriver, corrupt judge the incorruptible, created judge the creator <clears throat> yet i would not have you think that in saying this i take away the power of judging concerning things but i give counsel that no one walk through devious places and rush into errors without end and therefore i advise not only wise men but indeed all men who have a desire of knowing what is advantageous to them that they seek after the Nevia Emmet Yahushua, or the true foreteller, Yahushua. For it is he alone who knows all things, and who knows what and how every man is seeking. For he is within the mind of every one of us. But in those who have no desire of the knowledge of Elohim and his righteousness, he is inoperative. <clears throat> But he works in those who seek after that which is profitable to their inner beings and kindles in them the light of knowledge. So seek him first of all. And if you do not find him, do not expect that you will learn anything from any other. But he is soon found by those who diligently seek him through love of the truth and whose inner beings are not taken possession of by immorality. <clears throat> For he is present with those who desire him in the innocence of their inner beings, who bear patiently and draw sighs from the bottom of their hearts through love of the truth. Think about the different examples that we have in scripture here, like Lot and how he had to deal with those in Sodom. All right, like Shemuel, like Moshe, the meekest of all men, Dawid and his repentance and how he was humble in dealing with those that were in whatever position that they were, whether coming at him as friends or enemies. We have examples throughout scripture and in, in our ultimate example, Yahuwah, Yahushua himself. But to cling to him with love of the truth and to do his will in simplicity. <clears throat> When you have that disposition and de desire in you, he knows and he becomes active and he gives you that which you're looking for. This is, but he deserts 
malevolent mind, because as a foreteller, he knows the thoughts of everyone. And therefore, let no one think that he can find him by his own hokma or wisdom, unless, as we have said, he empty his mind of all immorality and conceive a pure and trustworthy desire to know him. For when anyone has so prepared himself, he himself as a Nabi or foreteller, seeing a mind prepared for him, of his own accord offers himself to his knowledge. <clears throat> and if you remember, this is what he meant by, lo, I am with you, even till the end of the age, right? And another way of putting that is where he had, when he was asking Kepha and the, the 12, well, who do you say that I am? And Kepha replied, you're the, the Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim. And our Mashiach said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who's in the Shemayim. And I say to you, you're a Kepha. And on this rock, meaning the inspiration or the knowledge given to the inner part of a man from the father through his son, on this rock, he's going to build his foundation and the gates of hell will not overcome it. That's, you know, misconstrued quite often by a mass of people today. But the idea of being pleasant to your maker and him making himself known to you is what's the secret all throughout scripture. And you can't force it because he's trustworthy and true. He's going to do what he said, regardless. You want... If you read the Proverbs, it's another example of these things. Chokma, our Mashiach, was waiting to pour out his benefits on the one who's right in his focus. And he's very specific about what he's looking for. You can see other examples of it in the Psalms. Like any of the Psalms that talk about by Dawid or by David concerning the beloved is another way that that's translated. And they're all speaking either in the person of our Mashiach or about him every time. In one of those, I can't remember which one, but it talks about what he's doing. And he says, every day, every morning, he uproots the wicked from the house of Yahuwah, right? No boasters are before his presence. And there's different aspects. But if you pay attention to it carefully, this is what he's doing for his assembly throughout the world. And those of those dispositions are either gathered in and kept as his or separated until they amend what they're doing. But back on track here. <clears throat> Says his deliverance is not to be questioned. Therefore, if anyone desires to learn all things, he must do so. It says little by little here, but I want to go down real quick. He, he must do so learning them one by one. That's the literal translation, you see. It says, whereas the text says he cannot do it by discussing them one by one, the italics being added by the translator. So if you just get rid of that and you say discussing them one by one, then you, it goes perfectly in line with what we can read right here, Yeshayahu 28, 9 and 10, where you learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, right? So this is what he's saying. He says, therefore, if anyone desires to learn all things, he must do so, learn, you know, one by one, or learning them one by one, for being mortal, he will not be able to comprehend all at once the counsel of Elohim and to scan immensity itself. But if, as we have said, he desires to learn all things, let him seek after the true foreteller. And when he has found him, let him not treat him with, or let him not treat with him by questions and disputations and arguments. But if he has given any response or pronounced any judgment, it cannot be doubted that this is certain. And therefore, before all things, let the foreteller of truth be sought and his words be laid hold of. Now, I want you to see how powerful that is. And another thing to keep in mind, it mentions, I think the first mention of it is in Pharaoh's dream, where he had two dreams. And it was one that was similar to the other, but not exact. 
And that was explained by Yahusuf to Pharaoh, that it was shown to him twice to emphasize the fact that it's, it's surely going to happen and it would be soon. So that kind of thing is established fact. You can go throughout everything that our Mashiach said, and there's some things where he's mentioning something once that, that's already enumerated elsewhere in scripture. And there's other times where he's reiterating things on multiple occasions just to solidify the fact that this is important. And when you pay attention to that, you learn so much more. But one time in all of the discourses that he ever did, he says three times in a row, something very, very meaningful. He's giving a warning and he says, where the worms will not die and the fire is not quenched. And then he repeats it again and then again, making it emphatically clear without any equivocation that there is a future judgment with unquenchable fire and undying worms. So that kind of thing really solidified that in my mind when I realized the importance of these things. He says, in respect to these, to continue, this only should be discussed by everyone that he may satisfy himself if they are truly Devarim Hanavi or words of the foreteller. That is, if they contain undoubted belief of things to come. If they mark out definite times. If they preserve the order of things. If they do not relate as last those things that are first nor as first those things that were done last, and if they contain nothing subtle, nothing composed by magic art to deceive, or if they have not transferred to themselves things that were revealed to others and have mixed them with falsehoods. And that's a prevalent one that we have to be mindful of today, okay? But this is a list of what you can tell to discern true foretelling, and we'll look at it in just a moment again. <clears throat> he says, and when all these things have been discussed by right judgment, it is established that they are words of the foreteller, so they ought to be at once believed concerning all things on which they have spoken and answered. Now, real quick, because this is very important, we have how to identify false foretellers which is fairly simple. Anyone who says something of, that's of Yahuwah and it doesn't come to pass is not of him because nothing false comes from him. He only is true. <clears throat> but right here, real quick, and I, if you pay attention to what we've gone over or what you're familiar with, with the anti mashiach for Dummies videos, all of these criteria will fit if you think about it. But also when you take the animal apocalypse from Hanok, the dark and bright waters from Baruch, the, the, you know, the parables of what would happen with the vine and the waters, or in, also in Baruch, or when you have Ezra's three-headed eagle, you have the, the Daniel's multiple visions, both Nebuchadnezzar and himself. These all fit these criteria if, when you take it and you, you Look at them. I encourage you to do that, and you'll find you'll, this is true. Where this is, if they contain undoubted belief of things to come, which assuredly everything in Scripture talks about his first or second coming, the events that would happen to his people, either the works that our Mashiach is doing, or the works that the enemy and the things that we'd be doing that he's allowed. So there's a variety of these things that are done. Is if they mark out definite times, you have definite times marked out in Daniel at the coming of our Mashiach on when different beast reigns would exist. And you have even more of that specifically put in in Revelation, where you have almost every time they do time conversions, you're doing specific times. And it's always exact with multiple different ways for it all to line up with that same time frame. So it even uses the same principle of multiple witnesses to confirm a matter, leaving nothing to chance, nothing just random or assumed. It's very beneficial to go over the stuff. 
but it says if they do not or right here if they preserve the order of things if they do not relate as last those things that are first nor as first those things that were done last and you know that's mixing up the orders of when his advent was or the times and seasons for what things would be and, and when we know that history repeats itself and there's nothing new under the sun but how to properly comprehend that and to not have just willy-nilly in uh what we comprehend to be the signs of the times because a lot of people will be confused and they'll pull things out of a variety of stuff um what I've learned to call soundbite theology, a verse here and a verse there, where you don't take the context of what is around it for the chapter to help, but you're just piecing this together to try to prove something. That very kind of theology is called Gnostic and refuted by Irenaeus in his five books called The, the Against Heresies, or The Refutation of Knowledge Falsely So-Called, as he titled it himself. But we know it is his five books called Against Heresies. All right, getting back on track. It says, nothing composed by magic art to deceive. And that has to do with like nothing subtle. That has to do with tricky words. Or, or we're very familiar with it. They have meanings of things that aren't necessarily what we know them to be commonly that kind of thing isn't done okay nothing composed by magic art to deceive or if they have not transferred to themselves things that were revealed to others and have mixed them with falsehoods and this is very prevalent with what all the gnostics were doing and what's happened quite a bit since that time where you take the foundational truths in scripture and then you add to or you take away and it ends up being something other than the good news once for all delivered to the Kodashim, right? But he says, when all these things have been discussed by right judgment, it is established they are words of the foreteller, so they ought to be at once believed concerning all things on which they have spoken and answered. So ignorance of the philosophers, this is for let us consider carefully the work of Yahuwah. For whereas the philosophers have introduced certain subtle and difficult words, so that not even the terms that they use in their discourses can be known and comprehended by all, Yahuwah has shown that those who thought themselves word framers are altogether unskillful as respects the knowledge of the truth. For the knowledge of things, that is imparted by the true foreteller Yahushua is simple and plain and brief, which those men walking through devious places and through the stony difficulties of words are wholly ignorant of. Therefore, to modest and simple minds, when they see things come to pass that have been foretold, it is enough and more than enough that they may receive most certain knowledge from most certain foreknowledge. And for the rest, they may be at shalom, having received evident knowledge of the truth. For all other things are treated by opinion, in which there can be nothing firm. For what speech is there that may not be contradicted? And what argument is there that may not be overthrown by another argument? And hence it is that by disputation of this sort, men can never come to any end of knowledge and learning, but find the end of their life sooner than the end of their questions. And therefore, since amongst these things, or since amongst these things are uncertain, <clears throat> I think it should say us. This is, and therefore, since amongst us these things are uncertain, we must come to the foreteller of truth. Abba Yahuwah, and if you're not familiar, Ab is the Hebrew word for father. Abba is Aramaic, and the Ba suffix is like the He prefix. So saying Ha Ab Yahuwah 
is the same as saying Abba Yahuwah, but it means the Father Yahuwah wants him to be loved by all, and accordingly he has been pleased wholly to extinguish those opinions that have originated with men, and in regard to which there is nothing like certainty, that he might be the more sought after, and that he whom they had obscured should now, or sorry, should show to men the way of truth. For on this account also Elohim made the world and filled it, whence also he is everywhere near to them who seek him, though he is sought in the remotest ends of the earth. But if anyone seeks him not in a pure, set-apart, and trustworthy manner, he is indeed within him, because he is everywhere, and is found within the minds of all men. But as we have said, he is dormant to the unbelieving, and is held to be absent from those by whom his existence is not believed. <clears throat> and just another witness, because we won't always have two or three, at least to establish everything. It mentions in Lamentations 4 that Mashiach Yahuwah, the breath of our nostrils, in whom shadow we desire to live among the nations. Right? He was taken in their pits or in their traps, it mentions. But that Mashiach Yahuwah, who's the breath of our nostrils, is in all men. And that's why he knows the minds of all men. But um, the other witness for that we already covered, so there's no reason to repeat it. <clears throat> it says, and when Kepha had said this, and more to the same effect, concerning Yahushua, he dismissed the crowds. And when he very earnestly entreated the old man to remain with us, he could prevail nothing, but he also departed to return next day, as had been agreed upon. And after this, we also with Kepha went to our lodging and enjoyed our accustomed food and rest. And now we're on book number nine. This is an explanation. This is on the following day, or Yom, Kepha, along with us, hastened early to the place in which the discussion had been held the day before. And when he saw that great crowds had assembled there to hear, and saw the old man with them, he said to him, Old man, it was agreed yesterday that you should confer today with Clement, and that you should either show that nothing takes place apart from Genesis or that Clement should prove that there is no such thing as Genesis, but that what we do is in our own power. To this the old man answered, I both remember what was agreed upon, and I keep in memory the words that you spoke after the agreement was made, in which you taught that it was impossible for man to know anything unless he learned from the true foreteller. Then Kepha said, you do not know what I meant, but I will now explain to you. I spoke of the will and purpose of Elohim, which he had before the world was, and by which purpose he made the world. Appointed times, gave the Torah, promised a world to come to the righteous for the rewarding of their good deeds and decreed punishments to the unrighteous according to a judicial sentence. I said that this counsel and this will of Elohim cannot be found out by men, which is what Shaul mentions, or Paul, where he says, no man can know the mind of a man unless he himself tell him. Neither can anyone know the mind of Elohim unless it's revealed to you. And it was made known to us through Mashiach. But to continue here, it says, I said that this counsel and this will of Elohim cannot be found out by men, because no man can gather the mind of Elohim from conjectures and opinion, unless a foreteller sent by him declare it. I did not therefore speak of any doctrines or studies, they cannot be found out, 
or known without a foreteller. For I know that both arts and sciences can be known and practiced by men once they have learned, not from it, the foreteller of truth, but from man instructors. Since therefore you profess to be conversant with the position of the stars and the courses of the Shamayim bodies, and that from these you can convince Clement that all things are subject to Genesis, or that you will learn from him that all things are governed by providence, and that we have something in our own power, <clears throat> it is now time for you two to set about this. To this the old man answered, Now indeed, it was not necessary to raise questions of this kind, if it were possible for us to learn from the true foreteller, and to hear in a definite proposition that anything depends on us and on the freedom of our will. For your yesterday's discourse affected me greatly, in which you disputed <clears throat> concerning the power of the foreteller. Whence also I assent to and confirm your judgment that nothing can be known by man with certainty and without doubt, seeing that he is but, or he has but a short period of life. A brief and slender breath by which he seems to be kept in life. However, since I am understood to have promised to Clement before I heard anything of the power of the foreteller, that I should show that all things are subject to Genesis, or that I should learn from him that there is something in ourselves, let him do me this favor that he first begin and propound and explain what may be objected. For I, ever since I heard from you a few words concerning the power of foretelling, have, I confess, been confounded, considering the greatness of foreknowledge. Nor do I think that anything ought to be received that is collected from conjectures and opinions. When the old man had said this, I, Clement, began to speak as follows. Yahuwah, by his son, created the world as a double house, separated by the interposition of this firmament, which he called Shamayim, and appointed Melachim, or messengers, to dwell in the higher, and a multitude of men to be born in this visible world, <clears throat> from amongst whom he might choose friends for his son, with whom he might rejoice and who might be prepared for him as a beloved bride for a bridegroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. But even till the time of the marriage, which is the revelation of the world to come, he has appointed a certain power to choose out and watch over the good ones of those who are born in this world and to preserve them for his son, who is without sin, set apart in a certain place of the world in which there are already some who are there being prepared. And if you're curious about what this is alluding to, this is the voice of Yahuwah walking in the midst of the garden with those that are in paradise right now, right? So he, he dwells there with Hanok or Ezra, Baruch, Eliyahu, and those that are like them. He says, in which they are already some who are being prepared, as I said, as a bride adorned for the coming of the bridegroom. For the prince of this world and of the present age is like an adulterer who corrupts and violates the minds of men and seducing them from the love of the true bridegroom allures them to strange lovers. But someone will say, how then was it necessary that that prince should be made? Who was to turn away the minds of men from the prince of truth, or the true prince? Because Yahuwah, who, as I have said, desired to prepare friends for his son, did not desire to create them so that they could not possibly be anything else 
but such as should desire of their own choice and will to be good. Because neither is that praiseworthy that is not desirable, nor is that judged to be good that is not sought for with purpose. There is no credit in being that from which the necessity of your nature does not admit your changing. Therefore, the providence of Elohim has willed that a multitude of men should be born in this world, that those who should choose a good life might be selected for many. And because he foresaw that the present world could not consist except by variety and inequality, he gave to each mind freedom of motions according to the diversities of present things, and appointed this prince through the prince's own suggestion of those things that run contrary, that the choice of better things might depend upon the exercise of virtue. And if you look up the original, like you get out the 1828 Webster's Dictionary definition of virtue, that number one is obedience to the truth. Right. <clears throat> right here, it says necessity of inequality. Yet to make our meaning plainer, we will explain it by particulars. Was it proper, for example, that all men in this world should be kings or princes or masters or teachers or lawyers or geometers or goldsmiths or bakers or smiths or grammarians or rich men or farmers or perfumers or fishermen or poor men? It is certain that all could not be these Yet the life of men requires all these professions and many more, and they cannot do without this variety of occupations. Therefore, inequality is necessary in this world, for there cannot be a messenger, sorry, a king, a melech, unless he has subjects over whom he may rule and reign. Nor can there be a master unless he has one over whom he may bear sway, and in like manner, of the rest and this theme like this topic of conversation how we should be all in our proper place and there's inequality in this life is reiterated in a longer form in first clement to the corinthians one of the epistles that clement wrote later on after he was an overseer this is arrangements of the world for the exercise of virtue Therefore, the Creator, knowing that no one would come to the contest of his own accord, while labor is shunned, that is, to the practice of those professions that we have mentioned, by means of which either right ruling or the mercy of everyone can be shown, made for men a body susceptible to hunger and thirst and cold, in order that men, being compelled for the sake of supporting their bodies, might come down to all the professions that we have mentioned by the necessity of livelihood. For we are taught to cultivate every one of these arts for the sake of food, drink, and clothing. And in this, the purpose of each one's mind is shown, whether he will supply the demands of hunger and cold by means of thefts and murders and perjuries and other crimes of that sort, or whether keeping right ruling and mercy and continuance, he will fulfill the service of eminent necessity by the practice of a profession and the labor of his hands. For if he supply his bodily wants with right ruling and obedience and mercy, he comes forth as a victor in the contest set before him and is chosen as a friend to the son of Yahuwah. But if he serves carnal lusts by frauds, inequities, and crimes, he becomes a friend of the prince of this world and of all demons, by whom he is also taught this, to ascribe to the courses of the stars the errors of his own evil doings, although he chooses them on purpose and willingly. For arts are learned and practiced, as we have said, under the compulsion of the desire of food and drink which desire when the knowledge of the truth comes to anyone becomes weaker 
and frugality takes its place. For what expense has those who use water and bread and only expect it from Yahuwah? There is therefore, as we have said, a certain necessary inequality in the dispensation of the world. Since indeed all men cannot know all things and accomplish all works, yet all need the use and service of almost all. And on this account, it is necessary that one work and another pay him for his work, that one be servant and another be master, that one be subject and or another be melech or king. But this inequality, which is a necessary provision for the life of men, Yahuwah has turned into an occasion for right ruling, mercy, and compassion. That while these things are transacted between man and man, everyone may have an opportunity of acting rightly with him to whom he has to pay wages for his work and of acting mercifully to him who cannot pay his debt through sickness or poverty and of acting compassionately towards those who by their creation seem to be subject to him. Also of maintaining gentleness towards subjects and of doing all things according to Yahuwah's Torah. For he has given a Torah by or thereby aiding the minds of men that they may the more easily perceive how they ought to act with respect to everything, in what way they may escape evil, and in what way tend to future Birakoth or blessings. And how being regenerate in water, they may be, or they may by good works extinguish the fire of their old birth. For our first birth descends through the fire of lust, and therefore, by Elohim's appointment, this second birth is introduced by water, which may extinguish the nature of fire. And that other Ruach, enlightened by Yahuwah's or sorry, and that the inner being, enlightened by Yahuwah's set-apart Ruach, may cast away the fear of the first birth, provided, however, it so live for the time to come, that it do not at all seek after any of the pleasures of this world, but be, as it were, a pilgrim and a stranger and a citizen of another city." And if you're wondering about the pleasures of the world, the, the, the balls, the banquet, the, the things that are not profitable for you to do, the, the big pagan feasts that they have, they celebrate, stuff of that nature. Don't really want to get into detail, but you know. He says, uses of evils. But if you will say that in those things indeed in which the necessity of creation demands the service of arts and works, Anyone may have it in his power to maintain right ruling and to put what restraint he pleases either upon his desires or his actions. What will we say of the sicknesses and infirmities that befall men and of some being harassed with demons and fevers and cold fits and some being attacked with madness or losing their reason and all those things that overwhelm the race of man with innumerable curses. To this we say that if anyone considers the reason of the whole mystery, he will pronounce that these things to be more right than those that we have already explained. For Elohim has given a nature to men by which they may be taught concerning what is good and to resist evil. That is, they may learn arts, and to resist vain pleasures, and to set the Torah of Elohim before them in all things. And for this end, he has permitted certain contrary powers to wander up and down in the world, and to strive against us, for the reasons that have been stated before, that by striving with them, the palm of victory and the merit of rewards may occur, or occur to the righteous. From this, therefore, 
sometimes the result of any person's acting incontently and being willing not so much to resist as to yield, to give harbor to these impulses in themselves by their noxious breath, an intemperate, ill-conditioned and diseased progeny is begotten. So this is talking about generational curses and the things that you could bring on yourself or on your children for what you choose to do willingly, right? For while lust is supposedly gratified, but no care is taken to the copulation, undoubtedly a weak generation is affected with the defects and frailties of those demons who instigate these evil deeds. And therefore parents are responsible for their children's defects of this sort, because they have not observed the Torah of intercourse. Though there are also more secret causes by which the inner beings are made subject to these evils, which it is not our present purpose to state. Yet it behooves everyone to acknowledge the way of Yahuwah, that he may learn from it the observance of generation and avoid causes of impurity, that that which is begotten may be pure. For it is not right that on the one hand, in the planting of shrubs and in the sowing of crops, a suitable season is sought for, and the land is cleansed, and all things are suitably prepared, lest the seed that is sown be injured and perish. That on the other hand, in the case of man only, who is over all these things, there should be no attention or caution in sowing his seed. But what, it is said, of the fact that some who in their childhood are free from any bodily defect, yet in process of time fall into those evils, so that some are even violently hurried on to death. Concerning these also, the account is at hand and is almost the same. For those powers that we have said to be contrary to the race of man are in some way invited into the heart of every one by many and diverse lusts and find a way of entrance. And they have in them such influence and power as can only encourage and incite, but cannot compel or accomplish. If therefore anyone consents to them so as to do those things that he immorally desires, his consent and deed will find the reward of destruction and the worst kind of death. But if thinking of the future judgment, he be checked by fear and reclaim himself so that he does not accomplish in action what he has conceived in his evil thought, he will not only escape present destruction, but also future punishments. For every cause of sin seems to be like flax smeared over with pitch, which immediately breaks into flame as soon as it receives the heat of fire. And the kindling of this fire is comprehended to be the work of demons. If therefore anyone be found smeared with sins and lusts as with pitch, the fire easily gets the mastery of him. But if the flax be not steeped in the pitch of sin, but in the water of purification and regeneration, the fire of the demons will not be able to be kindled in it. Yet someone will say, and what will we do now who have already been smeared with sins as with pitch? I answer, only hasten to be washed, that the fuel of the fire may be cleansed out of you by the invocation of Yahuwah Yahushua, and that for the future you may bridle your lusts by fear of the judgment to come, and by his constant power, beat back the hostile powers whenever they tempt you. But you say, and sorry, this is just like saying, use truth and reason to overcome the, the desires of the flesh, right? It says, yet you say, if anyone fall into love, how will he be able to contain himself, though he sees before his eyes even that river of fire that is called Pyrphlegathon, 
pyrophlegathon. Sorry, I kind of butchered that. This is the excuse of those who will not be converted to repentance. But now I would not have you talk of pyrophlegathon. Place before you man's punishments and see what influence fear has. When anyone is brought to punishment for the crime of love and is bound to the stake to be burned, can he at any time conceive any desire of her whom he loved or place her image before his eyes? By no means, you will say. You see then that present fear cuts off unrighteous desires. But if those who believe in Elohim and who confess the judgment to come and the penalty of ageless fire, if they do not refrain from sin, it is certain that they do not believe with full belief. For if belief is certain, fear also becomes certain. But if there be any defect in belief, fear also is weakened. And then the contrary powers find opportunity of entering. And when they have consented to their persuasions, they necessarily become subject also to their power and by their instigation are driven to the precipices of sin. Therefore, the astrologers being ignorant of such mysteries think that these things come by the course of the heavenly bodies. Hence also in their answers to those who go to them to consult them as to future things, they are deceived in very many instances. Nor is it to be wondered at, for they are not foretellers, but by long practice, the authors of errors find a sort of refuge in those things by which they were deceived and introduce certain climactic or cinematic periods climactic periods that they may pretend a knowledge of uncertain things. And now he was segueing on what was true. And now he's going into after having a proper comprehension of how things actually function, he's explaining what the astrologers do that kind of fakes it. But for anyone who's interested in learning about the origins of these things, you can learn about it in the book of Hanok chapters 10 through 16. And you also find the, the rolling on of what happens with this form of witchcraft in particular in the book of Yobelin. But after the flood, one of the descendants of Abraham found the writings of the Watchers, and it was actually Kazdim, or Hesed, I think his name was, and he wrote them down but didn't tell Noah, and he passed it on to his children, he founded Ur of the Kazdim, of which the Babylonian astrologers came from. And that, that was literally just the, the witchcraft right from the Watchers. This is for they represent these climate, yeah, climate tricks as times of danger in which one sometimes is destroyed, sometimes is not destroyed not knowing that it is not the course of the stars, but the operation of demons that regulates these things. And those demons, being anxious to confirm the error of astrology, deceive men to sin by mathematical calculations. So that, or what we call gramatria as well, it, you see it's just the same form in a different aspect. So that when they suffer the punishment of sin, either by the permission of Elohim or by legal sentence, the astrologer may seem to have spoken truth. And yet they are deceived even in this. For if men be quickly turned to repentance and remember and fear the future judgment, the punishment of death is remitted to those who are converted to Elohim by favor of mikvah or immersion. Retribution here or hereafter. <clears throat> but someone will say, many have committed even murder and adultery and other crimes and have suffered no evil. This indeed is rare among men, 
except that it may often be for those who know not the counsel of Elohim. But Elohim, who knows all things, knows how and why he who sins does sin, and what cause leads each one to sin. This, however, is in general to be noticed, that if any are evil, not so much in their mind as in their doings, and are not born to sin under the incitement of purpose, upon them punishment is inflicted more speedily and more in the present life. For everywhere and always Elohim renders to everyone according to their deeds, as he judges to be expedient. Now, I'm going to read, I'm going to read that one more time so you get the importance of this. But this is what I meant. And he mentions elsewhere, if you're, if you're not maliciously evil, if you're not planning out thoughts of evil against someone, but if you just do things that he said not to, and you don't do it because you're being compelled to through necessity, like no one's pointing a gun at you, your children saying, go still for me, or you're, you're not starving and filling, trying to feed your family, okay? If you're not incited to for purpose, then upon them, they are suffering more speedily in this life. And that's for, I mean, that's pretty much how I was throughout my entire childhood, even to today. I don't really think evil thoughts about anybody. I don't sit there and plan wicked things, but sometimes and every time I would do something that he said not to, man, I'd get hurt. Something would happen. I'd get in trouble every single time because it was expedient for him to do so to correct my, to correct things that were wrong. So if you're wondering why you just can't catch a break sometimes or bad things keep happening, it, it's most likely because you're not intentionally, but you are doing things that he said not to okay it says this however is in general to be noticed that if any are evil not so much in their mind as in their doings they are not born to sin or sorry and are not born to sin under the incitement of purpose upon them punishment is inflicted more speedily and more in the present life for everywhere and always Elohim renders to everyone according to his deeds, as he, Elohim, judges to be expedient. But those who purposely practice immorality, so that they sometimes even rage against those from whom they have received benefits, like how Shaul treated Dawid, right? And who take no thought for repentance, their punishment he defers to the future. And not like Shaul. Shaul was a sovereign over his own people, but while he was long suffering to him, he did suffer when he was corrected in this life. But there are those that are, I'm sure you can think of a, a laundry list of them. No reason to, to name names or anything. But there are men in this life who don't seem to suffer the effects of the things that they're doing, which is immense evil, because they're going to be suffering where the fire is not quenched and the worm doesn't die and our creator is patient. But it says, so that they sometimes even rage against those from whom they have received benefits and who take no thought for repentance. Their punishment he defers to the future. For these men do not, like those of whom we spoke before, deserve to end the punishment of their crimes in the present life, but it is allowed them to occupy the present time as they will, because their correction is not such as to need temporal chastisements, but such as to demand the punishment of inheriting ageless fire, and their inner beings will seek repentance where they will not be able to find it. But if, while in this life, they had placed before their eyes the punishments that they will then suffer. They would certainly have bridled their lusts and would in no wise have fallen into sin. For the comprehension of the inner being has much power for cutting off all its desires, especially when it has acquired the knowledge of Shamayim things, by means of which, having received the light of truth, 
it will turn away from all darkness of evil actions. For as the sun obscures and conceals all the stars by the brightness of his shining, so also the mind, by the light of knowledge, renders all the lusts of the being ineffective and inactive, sending out upon them the thought of the judgment to come as its beams are raised, so that they can no longer appear in the inner being. Yet, as a proof that the fear of Elohim is quite effective for the repressing of lusts, take the example of man's fear. And before we read that real quick, another example, if you want an excellent expose on reason and truth, being able to be over all passions, you can read the account in 2 Maccabees, but the entirety of the book of 4th Maccabees is about that very subject. It's a very horrible subject, but the elderly Kohen, seven sons from a child to a man and their mother all prove that they would rather keep reason and truth than capitulate to fear through torture. So it's something that was a foreshadowing of the things to come, but also to show that you can reasonably do what's right and hold to the truth, no matter the odds or no matter what was going to happen to your body, which is exactly why Mashiach or Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach had said, do not fear him who can destroy the body, but is not able to do anything else. Fear him who can destroy the body and then send the send you into Gehenna. But he says, who is there among men that has never coveted his neighbor's goods? And yet they are restrained and act honestly through fear of the punishment that is prescribed by the laws. Through fear, tribes are subject to their kings and armies obey with arms in their hands. Slaves, although they are stronger than their masters, yet through fear submit to their master's rule. Even wild beasts are tamed by fear, and the strongest bulls submit their necks to the yoke, and huge elephants obey their masters through fear. But why do we use man's examples? When even Elohims are not wanting, does not the earth itself remain under the fear of precept, which it testifies by its motion and quaking? The sea keeps its prescribed bonds. The messengers maintain shalom. The stars keep their order and the rivers their channels. It is certain also that demons are put to flight by fear and not to lengthen the discourse by too many particulars, we see how the fear of Elohim restraining everything keeps all things in proper harmony and in their fixed order. How much more, then, may you be sure that the lusts of demons that arise in your hearts may be extinguished and wholly abolished by the admonition of the fear of Yahuwah? when even the inciters of lust are themselves put to flight by the influence of fear. You know that these things are so, but if you have anything to answer, proceed. Then said the old man, my son Clement has wisely framed his argument so that he has left us nothing to say to these things. But all his discourse that he has delivered on the nature of men has this bearing, that along with the fact that freedom of will is in man, there is also some cause of evil apart from him, whereby men are indeed incited by various lusts, yet are not compelled to sin. And for this reason, be said, because fear is more powerful than they. And it resists and checks the violence of desires. So that although natural emotions may arise, yet sin may not be committed. Those demons being put to flight who incite and inflame these emotions. But these things do not convince me, for I am conscious of certain things from which I know well that by the arrangement of the Shamayim bodies, men become murderers or adulterers and 
perpetrate other evils. And in like manner, honorable and modest women are compelled to act well. And if you remember, Clement already answered why that is, because the adversary and his minions intentionally use mathematics. They use these places to cause those influences at those very times to incite those things to happen. But it still relies on the act of a man to do it, which is what Clement goes into. That's why they're not always accurate in their prognostications here. But real quick, I think we'll get one more or maybe two and we'll have to wrap it up for today. He says, in short, when Mars holding the center in his house regards Saturn quarterly with Mercury towards the center, the full moon coming upon him in the daily Genesis, he produces murderers and those who are to fall by the sword, bloody, drunken, lustful, devilish men, inquirers into secrets, malefactors, scoffers, and such like, especially when there was no one of the good stars looking on. But again, Mars himself having a quarterly position with respect to Venus in a direction toward the center, while no good star looks on, produces adulterers and incestuous persons. Venus with the moon in the borders of the houses of Saturn, if she was with Saturn and Mars looking on, produces women that are loud and overbearing, ready for agriculture, building, and every manly work, to commit adultery with whom they please and not to be convicted by their husbands, to use no delicacy, nor ointments, nor feminine robes and shoes, but to live after the fashion of men. But the unencouraging Venus makes men to be as women and not to act in any respect as men. If she is with Mars in Aries, on the contrary, she produces women if she is in Capricorn or Aquarius. And this might be confusing. It's not really something that you have to wrap your mind around completely, but he's just pointing out different conjunctions of where the, the, the luminaries are and then the things that it's supposed to purport that happens in creation because of it. <clears throat> and when the old man had pursued this subject at great length and had enumerated every kind of mathematical figure, and also the position of the Shamayim bodies, wishing thereby to show that fear is not sufficient to restrain lusts, I answered again, truly, my father, you have argued most learnedly and skillfully, and reason herself invites me to say something in answer to your discourse, since indeed I am acquainted with the science of mathematics and gladly hold a conference with so learned a man. Listen, therefore, while I reply to you, or to what you have said, that you may learn distinctly that fate or Genesis is not at all from the stars, and that it is possible for those who have recourse to Yahuwah to resist the assaults of demon, or the assault of demons. And, as I said before, that not only by the fear of Elohim can natural lust be restrained, but even by the fear of men, as we will now instruct you. There are in every country or kingdom laws imposed by men, enduring either by writing or simply through custom, which no one easily transgresses. In short, the first series or Chinese who dwell at the beginning of the world have a law not to know murder, nor adultery, nor harlotry or whoredom, and not to commit theft, and not to worship idols. And in all that country, which is very large, there is neither hekel or temple, nor image, nor harlot, nor adulteress, nor is any thief brought to trial. But neither is any man ever slain there, and no man's liberty of will is compelled, according to your doctrine, by the fiery star of Mars 
to use the sword for the murder of a man, nor does Venus in conjunction with Mars compel to adultery. Although, of course, with them, Mars occupies the middle circle of the Shamayim every day. But amongst the Chinese or Ceres, the fear of laws is more powerful than the configuration of Genesis. There are likewise amongst the Bractians in the Indian countries, immense multitudes of Brahmins who also themselves from the tradition of their ancestors and peaceful customs and laws, neither commit murder nor adultery nor worship idols, nor have the practice of eating animal food, are never drunk, never do anything maliciously, but always fear Elohim. And these things indeed they do, though the rest of the Indians commit both murders and adulteries and worship idols, and are drunken, and practice other immoralities of this sort. Indeed, in the western parts of India itself, there is a certain country where strangers, when they enter it, are taken and slaughtered and eaten. And neither have good stars prevented these men from such immoralities and from accursed food, nor have evil stars compelled the Brahmins to do any evil. Again, there is a custom among the Persians to marry mothers and sisters and daughters. And in that district, the Persians contact, or contract incestuous marriages. And that those who study mathematics may not have it in their power to use that subterfuge by which they say that there are certain districts of Shemayim to which it is granted to have some things peculiar to themselves. Some of that tribe of Persians have gone to foreign countries who are called Hamagai, of whom there are some to this day in Medai, others in Parthia, mm -hmm. some also in Mitzrayim, and a considerable number in Galatia and Phrygia all of whom maintain the form of this incestuous tradition without variation. If you're not familiar, the Persians themselves were a people group that were an amalgamation from the sons of Zoroaster originally, who was Mitzrayim, as well as Eleazar, the servant of Abraham and he would have taken his goods and left off of it. It mentions that earlier in the book, if you recall, that the Persians stem from them generally. And they were in league with the Madai or the Medes, who was a son of Yepheth who had come to dwell in Shem's area, if you recall. But to continue real quick, it says, all of whom maintain the form of this incestuous tradition without variation and hand it down to their posterity to be observed, even although they have changed their district of Shamayim, or heaven. Nor has Venus with the moon in the confines and houses of Saturn, with Saturn also and Mars looking on, compelled them to have a genesis among other men. Amongst the Gaeli, the, the Gaels, right? Also, there is a custom that women cultivate the fields, build, and do every manly work, and that they are also allowed to have intercourse with whom they please and are not found fault by their husbands or called adulteresses. For they have promiscuous intercourse everywhere, and especially with strangers. They do not use ointments, they do not wear dyed garments or shoes. On the other hand, the men of the Gilones, so not the Gili, I apologize, but the men of the Gilones are adorned, combed, clothed in soft and various colored garments, decked with gold and besmeared with ointments, and that not through lack of manliness, for they are most warlike and most keen hunters. Yet the whole women of the Gilones had not at their birth the unfavorable Venus in Capricorn or Aquarius, nor had all the men Venus placed with Mars in Aries, by which configuration the Kazdim science, and here he tells you where it comes from, the Kazdim, like I had mentioned 
it was from the watchers that he picked up, right? Or by which the configuration of the Kazdim science asserts that men are born effemite and desolate or desolate. And just so you know, this is Chaldean, but the word is actually Kazdim. We've talked about that a few times. And just for someone who might not know, the Chaldeans are the Chaldonians, which were a, a righteous remnant of the Hebrews that were in what we call Scotland for a very long time. And they were a very, very pesky thorn in the side of Rome for a very long time as well, to the point that they really hate them. And they, they hate them so much, they changed the name of the Kazdim to the, their worst enemy, the, the Chaldeans. <laughs> and that's why we have that word there. Real quick, it says, but further in Susa, the women use ointments and indeed the best sort, de being decked with ointments and precious stones. Also, they go abroad, supported by the aid of their ma maidservants with much greater ambition than the men. They do not, however, cultivate modesty, but have intercourse indifferently with whomever they please, with slaves and guests, such liberty being allowed them by their husbands. And not only are they not blamed for this, but they also rule over their husbands. And yet the genesis of all the Susan women have not Venus with Jupiter and Mars in the middle of the Shemayim in the houses of Jupiter. In the remoter parts of the East, if a boy is treated unnaturally when it is discovered, he is killed by his brothers or his parents or any of his relations and is left unburied. And again, among the Gauls, an old law allows boys to be thus treated publicly and no dishonor is thought to attach to it. It is possible that all those who are so basely treated among the Gauls had had Lucifer with Mercury in the houses of Saturn and the confines of Mars. And remember, that's the light bearer, which I thought was a name for Venus there, but it, it could be the day star, which is also Venus. So I'm not sure why it would have that one. We'll put the look into that later. But we're almost finished here. We have to go. It says, in the regions of Britain, several men have one wife. In Parthia, many women have one husband. And each part of the world adheres to its own manners and institutions. None of the Amazons have husbands, but like animals, they go out from their own territories once a year about the vernal equinox and live with men of the neighboring tribe, observing a sort of solemnity the while. And when they have conceived by them, they return. And if they bring forth a male child, they cast him away and rear only females. Now, since the birth of all is at one season, it is absurd to suppose that the case of male Mars is at the time, or in the case of males, Mars is at the time in equal portions with Saturn, but never in the genesis of females, and that they have not Mercury placed with Venus in his own houses, so as to produce either painters or sculptors or money changers or in the houses of Venus, so that perfumers or singers or poets might be produced. Among the Saracens and Upper Libyans and Moors and the dwellers about the mouths of the ocean, and also in the remote districts of Germany and among the Sarmatians and Scythians and all the tribes who dwell in the regions of the Pontic shore and in the island of Tracy, there is, or Charcy, sorry, there is never found among, uh, never found a money changer, nor a sculptor, nor a painter, nor an architect, nor a geometrician, nor a tragian, uh, that's someone who does the plays, right, nor a poet. Can it be, therefore, that the influence of Mercury and Venus must be wanting among them? And the whole point right here, this is the Medes alone in all the world throw men still breathing to the be devoured by dogs. Yet they have not Mars with the moon placed in cancer all through their daily genesis. 
The Indians burn their dead, and the wives of the dead voluntarily offer themselves and are burned with them. But all the Indian women who are burned alive have not the sun under the earth in nightly Genesis, with Mars in the regions of Mars. Very many of the Germans and their lives by the halter, but all have not, therefore, the moon with Hora or get by Saturn and Mars. From all this, it appears that the fear of the laws bear sway in every country, and the freedom of will that is implanted in man by the Ruach compels or complies with the laws. And Genesis can neither compel the Chinese to commit murder, nor the Brahmins to eat flesh, nor the Persians to shun incest, nor the Indians to refrain from suti, which is when a wife will emulate herself after her husband dies, nor the Medes from being devoured by dogs, nor the Parthians from having many wives, nor the women of Mesopotamia from preserving their chastity, nor the Greeks from athletic exercise, nor the Gaelic boys from being abused, nor can it compel the barbarous tribes to be instructed in the studies of the Greeks. But as we have said, each tribe observes its own laws according to free will and annuls the decrees of Genesis by the strictness of laws. All right, and I think that would be an excellent place to stop because he'll go into more detail about the climates that he had mentioned and how climates are used as a pretext for the, the point there. But it's another section that's a little long. And I think that what we covered is pretty, pretty amazing and very worthwhile to sit and chew on. So with that, everyone, you have a wonderful Shabbat. And we will see you next time.